Well, obviously we have we, you know we have certain issues here. We have we have kind of loan to value issues, which which I'm sure you've heard about. I mean, what 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 are solutions that we need to come before we can get investors like you to start dumping lots of money in? Well, we're ready to buy a business here tomorrow. I mean, I, okay. I tried to buy Dan on April first, but then it turned out he had his <laughs> right. fingers crossed. Well, but, stuck in the name, but right? April second, I called you. You didn't answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we've actually come reasonably close to a few in the past. I mean, quite a ways past. But, uh, but, yeah, but, but any time they come, you know, we, if the phone rings tomorrow and they're calling from Detroit, believe me, I will be taking it. Okay. <laughs> you know, give us kind of a, a hint of what you're going to say up there. Why are you bullish on Detroit? I don't Detroit? know. I'm, 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 I'm just he, interviewing he, him. He, so he, he okay. questions. Yeah. Well, then why are you bullish on Detroit? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, stay around and listen to the, uh, I, don't want you, I don't want you to miss the... Uh, <laughs> Let's talk a little bit here about uh, Detroit. What, what, what is your view? What, what happened here from the outside looking in? Well, <clears throat> the biggest thing, the finances got out of hand. And, you know, that's happened to plenty of cities before. Uh, Forty years ago in New York, uh, you know, it was on its back. Uh, and the President of the United States actually said that New York dropped dead. You know, that was a famous headline. He didn't headline. mean it though, right? <laughs> no, but why? Well, they felt they met it in New York. It was a headline <laughs> in the New York Daily News. President of New York dropped dead. But the, the city had, they lost their credit mm -hmm. and there, everybody was fighting with everybody else. The unions, the p politicians, the bankers, and, you know, the business people, they were all mad at each other. And, but they sat down and they actually worked out a solution that was like a bankruptcy, but it wasn't an official one. They, they, they set up something called Big Mac, and Felix Rodin was involved, but Victor Gottbaum from the, from the uh, unions was involved, and, and, and they worked out something that made sense. Now, it didn't, didn't transform things in a, in a day or a week or a month, but just look what's happened. I mean, the yeah. cities, you know, the, they have an inherent strength and vibrant. I mean, yeah. you've got great headquarters uh, companies in, 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 in Detroit, and that's enormously important. It's yeah. been important in Omaha, but... Speak, the, speaking of headquarters, I, I, if I had done my research correctly, uh, your funds, or one of your funds under Berkshire, owns 2 percentage or something of General Motors, and you, just, you guys just added to the position? Yeah, we've got two, two fellows, that, one of whom we hired maybe three to four years ago, and the other one two to three years ago. <clears throat> I hired them, when I hired them, they managed a billion dollars each, but I've kept giving them more money to manage. And sooner so or later, that adds up, billion dollars. Yeah, well, and, no. and they're up to nine yeah. billion apiece yeah, now. Yeah. And, and, and when I'm not in the picture, they'll be, they'll be running a couple hundred billion. Um, so, uh, That's not and they're terrific no. guys. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, but one of them uh, has about close to 15% of his uh, fund in General Motors stock. And, and actually when <clears throat> Mary Barra came out three or four months ago, uh, this fellow's name is Ted Weschler, and mm -hmm. the three of us went out to lunch. And, How'd that go? Uh, well, I was enormously impressed with her, and uh, as I drove her down in my 19, or my 2000, probably <laughs> a little Freudian slip there, my 2006 <laughs> Cadillac, uh, I said, Mary, you know, is the new one any better than this? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got a rather fulsome answer to that, and, <laughs> and uh, so the next day I, I told my daughter, I said, go, go out and buy me one of these new Cadillacs, and, uh, and I wrote Mary about it later, but she, she, Mary is, I mean, she is a real car guy, I will tell you that, uh, you yeah. can just tell, I mean, she has a It looks passion. like a car guy, yeah. She, she has a passion for it, I, uh, yep. uh, I love it when CEOs have a passion for their business. Uh, uh, it's, it's enormously important. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, if I had a one-line em employment form, I'd almost say, are you passionate about what you do? Because it, it works. And, and she really is. And she knows cars forwards and backwards. She, she's really good. So what is your view overall of the Detroit automobile makers and, and now post-bankruptcy? What's their future look like? The American public is, of course, worldwide too. But, but you know, when I was 16, I was only thinking about two things, cars and girls. You know, I wasn't very good with girls, so I just kind of narrowed it down a little bit. But, uh, uh, although if you had the right car, it helped with girls, too. I mean, That's true. They, uh, I mean, Americans love cars. You know, yep. they're in love with their cars. And, and it all started here, too. So it, it, there's really nothing more quintessentially American than the car. 
and, and, and I think people feel that the world over. They're driving American cars. But you probably wouldn't have bought 2% of General Motors seven, eight years ago, right? What, what from an investor standpoint, changed that at least you allowed your guy or he decided to... Well, he, it's, it's he, his decision, his I decision, should say okay. that. But, but <clears throat> the, the, car, the car, car business, it got rationalized to some degree by what it went through a few years ago. And, uh, uh, but they'll always sell a lot of cars, predicting who's going to sell them and how much money they're going to make per car is another question. Yep. But we're going to sell, you know, it's going to be almost 17 million cars this year, and that was yep. down around nine in a fraction, you know, not that long ago. Yep. The American public will always love cars. You can always get people's eyes to light up do, if you show them a new car. Do you think the U.S. federal government should have bailed out General Motors? And yeah, I, I publicly, on March, I think it was March 6th, 2009, I was asked that question on CNBC, and mm -hmm. you can look up the answer. I wouldn't have guessed I would have given that answer maybe 30 or 40 years ago, yeah. but it was so clear to me in 2009 that A, it would work, because mm -hmm. you want to do something that's going to work, but yep. the idea that uh, you should let the financial condition you know, of the company destroy it when you had so much going for it over time. And it was so important to America, and you get into parts suppliers and dealers and finance operators. I mean, it would have been a death blow, in my view, if uh, Washington had thumbed its nose at, at, at the car companies then. And so I, I, I declared myself publicly on that. And the country, if you think of what would have happened, it didn't cost them anything in the end, yep. you know, speak of anyway. Uh, if you think of what would have happened if they made the other decision, you could write a book about it. What if the government had said no? Yeah. It would not be a pretty story. I don't know if we'd be sitting here right now. No, that's, so, that's, that's right. Yeah. I, I, I actually give a lot of credit. You can argue about how we got in all the trouble we did in 2008 and nine, and there were plenty of blame to go around and all of that. But once September 2008 hit, I was not a Bush supporter, but Bush did the right thing. And you had, you had Bernanke, and you had Paulson, and you had, later had Geithner, and, and, and you had Obama. Those people did what was in the interest of the country. Now, you, could, you know, yeah. it, it, I said it was a lot like Pearl Harbor. Maybe those ships shouldn't have all been in the harbor. Right. But once the attack came, there was no sense the Navy, the, the Army blaming the Navy for, you know, having too great a concentration and the Navy getting defensive. I mean, we had a war on, and we had a, we had a, we had a survival war for the economy going on. How, how does this work for, you know, so all of us, you know, so it's 2008, the world is melting down. Does like President Bush or Obama, or I guess at, at that time Bush or Gardner, they call, I mean, you getting calls in Omaha, is it ringing off the hook? Like what's going on in your office in Omaha? <clears throat> well, people that are looking so, for money call. <laughs> okay. Just, just, just like, yeah. hey, hey, Warren, yeah. country's yeah. going down. How's my favorite guy in Omaha? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it, is it, and, and, and your, assi yeah. your assistant... Uh, I started looking like George Clooney, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Does, now, I, Debbie, who I've met several times, and she's, you know, I, I, got, a, I got a flavor of who works for who back, backstage there. It's, it's, you know, but but d does, um, does she screen? Like, will she screen the price? Say, no, I'll get back to you, Mr. President. I mean, how, how does it work? If she does that, I haven't heard about it. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, so, it was, it, but it was interesting because... George Bush, and I, I give him enormous credit for this. I didn't vote for him, but I, he came out and he issued the 10 most important words in the history of, of economics. I mean, you know, Adam Smith back in 1776 talked about the specialization of labor, the invisible hand, and, and you had Keynes talk about animal spirits and all these things. George Bush came out on the White House lawn and he said, if money doesn't loosen up, this sucker can go down. Now, <laughs> that, that is a great, great academic statement. That was. I mean, that was. <laughs> I, I'd sort of be interested to see the first version of that before they, yeah, uh, well, it, it, they agreed on that one. They said, but he, but he, in effect, he let both the Treasury, and of course he doesn't have control over the Fed, but nevertheless, the Fed has to be in sync. But Bernanke and Paulson could then say, we'll do whatever it takes. If you remember, when the American public really got scared was when money market funds broke the buck. Yep. 35 million Americans 
at the start of September thought three and a half trillion of their money was safe in money market funds. And then in one week, mm -hmm. they, they got worried about it. And 175 billion flowed out of money market funds in three days uh, in mid to late September. And that was just starting. Uh, it's an interesting thing. The Treasury, Hank Paulson, in effect guaranteed money market funds at that time. Yeah. He did it with something called, uh, I forget the, uh, the currency or the economic stabilization fund. That was a fund that was set up in 1934 when we changed the price of gold. And we had a profit because we changed the price of gold. So we just stuck it in this fund at that time. Nobody ever dreamt it would be used for guaranteeing money market funds. I'm not sure that the authority existed to do it, but the right thing to did, do was did, to do it. Did somebody back, back there, some lawyer, say, hey, there's this 1934 thing we can do, or did, it, did they just do something and then rely I think, back? I think, I, I, I think they just decided they had to do it. Yeah. And, you know, if they had to call it, you know, soybean supports right. <laughs> stuff, they would have took under right. the soybean funds. I mean, but they, you, you needed that then. There was nobody but the... The whole American public and American business needed to deleverage, and there was only one party that could leverage up, and that was the U.S. government, and, and they did it right, and I took so, my hand to them. So speaking of guaranteeing uh, big entities and, and big potential calamities, and we saw that, the, in essence, the federal government did that with New York City in the 70s, do you think uh, Detroit should have been, in essence, bailed out of the bankruptcy? Would that have been better for the country and for the city? Well, I... I, I I think, I think as long as the bankruptcy is handled fairly quickly, mm -hmm. bankruptcy is fine. I mean, that is how you clean the slate. General Motors went bankrupt. You know, I mean, it, no, they just they did it in a hurry. I mean, I mean they, it was prepackaged in effect. Yeah. But they got rid of some things that shouldn't have been done in the past, and they made themselves competitive for the future. And, and, and now they're employing I don't know how many thousands of people. So. One way or another, if you make terrible mistakes in the past, you can do it as an individual. I mean, yeah. millions of people do it, and they, they make a mistake, and the world allows you to clear the slate, and you don't do it without cost. Mm -hmm. But it was important that Detroit clear the slate, and it looks to me like they're doing it promptly, and I, you know, I salute yeah. you for it. So you told me something interesting a few months ago. Uh, Warren was in Detroit in November of, of just last year for the launch of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 business thing, and uh, we were driving you back to the airport, and you, you said something to me about, you see that bridge over there? And I said, yeah. He said, I almost bought that bridge one day. And he was talking about the Ambassador Bridge. Yeah. I was pretty shocked about that. Can you tell, I think everybody would be interested in hearing how that, because you might have been a, a pretty good owner for that bridge, come to think of it. Um, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tell, tell us. Uh, Maddie's made me look good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so how, what exactly, I was shocked to hear that. I did not know that. Well, what happened? When I got out of school in 1951, I took all the Moody's manuals, and there were four or five of them, the industrials, the banks, and finance, about 10,000 pages. And I, I was 20 years old then, and I just turned the page, and I went through and looked at every company for 10,000 pages. And it was in the transportation manual, interestingly enough. They had both the Detroit International Bridge and they had the Detroit and Canada Tunnel. Yeah. And those were both quite interesting. Uh, so I f started following them. And, and then in the 1970s, uh, we bought a fair amount of stock in the, in the bridge. There was a fellow named Phil Correa at Pioneer Fund owned a fair amount. They actually put my partner, Charlie Munger, on the board. Mm -hmm. And I think we got up to 20 odd percent. And uh, the Canadians were kind of holding us up on that, at, at that point. There was, a, uh, I think there was something called FEAR, the Foreign Investment Review Act, mm -hmm. and th th they just held it up long enough so that Matty got interested, and, and he came in and started bidding against us, and, and, uh, and uh, he ended up owning the bridge. But, uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's too bad. As that's I understand, it started... Um, <laughs> As I understand, so, the tolls went up just a little bit yeah, after that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there, there hasn't been any issues in the last four or five years. There. I remember the time we, we, you know, when we looked at it, the, the tunnel was terribly crowded. So it didn't really yep. look like you could handle much more capacity with the tunnel, yep. whereas the bridge, the bridge is one hell of a bridge. Right. You know? <laughs> in reading your books over the years, that, that's always sort of been a thing with yours, almost metaphorically and, and actually literally 
bridges, toll booths, things like that. Where, where did that thinking actually come yeah, from? Yeah, well, it was, it was in a, you know, there were not a lot of other ways to yeah. <laughs> cross. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this unusual situation where half of it was in Canada and half of it was in the United States, which, yeah. which complicated things. As I remember, this goes back 40 or 50 years, but as I remember there was a liquor store there, you know, that was just tiny, that was making a fortune. I don't know which side of the bridge it was on, but, yeah. but uh, uh, that's the closest I've ever come. I own about a quarter of a bridge, but owning a quarter of a bridge really doesn't quite do the job. I mean. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> what is your view of what Detroit has to do to get the confidence or, or keep building the confidence of people outside Detroit? Or even, you know, we have, we have a bunch of uh, what, what we're terming as expats here. Um, you know, I don't know if I you know, totally like that word because I think most people are tied to Detroit and in some way, shape, or form. And, and you don't want to, you know, make people feel otherwise. But... How do you continue to, to gain the momentum for particularly people who have nothing to do with Detroit? Yeah, well, well, headquarters companies are terribly important. I mean, uh, the cities get in the biz business world somewhat identified by headquarters cities. I think athletic teams are very important in terms of just the spirit of a town. And uh, uh, there's one in Cleveland. You know, they got a pretty good player. So that that's is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, what was his name? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but, but what, 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 is there anything that, that we all, you, you know, could do or you, that you see different from the, from the outside? Again, being an astute investor like you are, is there any, any kind of actions that, that could be taken or should be taken, do you think? I think when you do look, I, I, you do look at headquarters now. You look at transportation. You look at philanthropy within a town. Mm -hmm. see just how much the citizens of the town care about their own town. Uh, uh, there, there are a number of variables like that. Now, we've looked at, in fact, we had a contract virtually to, to, to buy one business up here, and, and as you mentioned, we, you know, we almost bought the bridge. We've looked at others. I mean, we, we would buy a company in Detroit today, was, and, and we'd be happy to have the headquarters here. Would, would you always, would you have said that five years ago, three years ago, 10 well, years it, ago? Well, it's, it's, it's much better after the bankruptcy than before. I mean, yeah. if you see a bankruptcy coming, yep. that is not encouraging. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, I mean, it, well, if you were a parts supplier to an auto company, you'd have right. worried plenty, yep. you know, in, in, in the early 2009. I mean, you, you know, your destiny would depend on what, what happened with somebody. So, but that's past, you know, and, and, yep. and so you've got prosperous home office companies here. I mean, you know, a company like your own, you're going to be employing a lot more people five years from now or ten years from now. I'll put it this way: You've been you, you bought a lot of real estate around here. Yeah, a little bit. If, yeah. if, if you want, if you want to sell me half of it at your cost, I'll take it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you got witnesses out there. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, it depends what we throw in with it. That might be, you know, <laughs> but but um, you know, casinos and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, so so I like those safe deposit boxes in the basement of yeah. the Bank of the Commonwealth Building. That's true. You know, <laughs> actually, we that's a true story. We we took Warren for a tour and down at the. <laughs> What's the, now the, the Chrysler House, which was the dime building, they, they preserved these old safety boxes. And so, you know, you want to open up a few at a time because it's not like the Geraldo Rivero thing where there's nothing in. So he's, he opens it up. There's a, the only guy, there's a dollar in there. More, no one else. It's a true story. Yeah. Well, Dan, the only guy found the dollar. <coughs> Dan, Dan wanted to sell me the whole group of unopened boxes. And, of course, he had this one fake box that he'd already opened. They put a whole bunch of money in that. Yeah. <laughs> He's, that's, they call that solving the mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh man. Okay, so let's talk about um, this concept of coming home. There's this concept of coming home. All these people, in essence, here, these, these very successful people in the room, a lot of them, have, you know, come home. Um, you stayed in Omaha. You never moved to, to New York permanently as your, as your primary home. And, you know, there's another guy I mentioned earlier, you know, went from that glitz all down in South Beach and decided to come home. Uh, you know, is, do you think that's becoming, you know, more of a trend? Or, or I guess I ask you the first question, why, why didn't you ever move out of Omaha? I, I could live any place I want, you yeah. know, and I could do business any place I want. And uh, I could not live better than I live now. Yeah. I could spend more money than I spend now. I bet yeah. the cost of living and the standard of living up to a certain point, correlate pretty well. I but mean, I'm going to make but, a but assumption that's point, not why you didn't move out of Omaha. Well, but, but, but I am in a house I've been in now for 56 years. 
That's, that's uh, about a quarter of the lifetime of the country, one quarter of the lifetime of the country. My kids grew up there. They were happy there. Other, our, our house was kind of a neighborhood center, and the kids all came over. Now, 50 years later, when my daughter's friends come back town, they want to come to the house. They want to see me wandering around in a bathroom eating popcorn just like they did you know, 50 <laughs> years ago. I, you know, it's five minutes. Were you eating popcorn in the bathroom? No, uh, or just... In the bathrobe. Oh, I, bathrobe. I, I, I'm I'd, sorry. I'd be yeah. in there going through these Moody's manuals looking at Detroit and International I did, Bridge. I but, got you. But I'd wander in, make some popcorn, and they, uh, they went to the same schools, public schools, that my father went to. Their kids have gone to those schools. Their grandchildren have gone to uh, my grandchildren have gone to those schools. Uh, there's a continuity of life. You know the people. You know the doctors. You know mm -hmm. everything about it. You know, it, yeah. and it, they're good experiences. Now, I, if I move out to Palm Springs or something like that, I may have great neighbors too. I'll probably never know them. I mean, yeah. uh, in my zip code, there are over 100 shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway. Mm. You know, I'm with friends as long as the stock's up anyway. <laughs> but but yeah. I mean, Probably going to take you, you to dinner. When you've got 100 now. shareholders in your zip code, I mean, when you go out trick or treating, you do all right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. So, 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 Warren, you, you've been known to uh, have some great quotes over the years, and I wrote down a few of them. And I, a few of them are, you, you can understand just on the face of it, no, no problem. But there's a few that may need a little bit more explanation. You may get that. So, I want to just, can I give you a few of them? You tell, okay, so it, this is one of my favorites here. It says, you can't produce a baby in one month by getting nine women pregnant. Yeah. So what does that mean? <laughs> it, it means that there are some things that can't be hurried up. You know, like building, yep. a, like building a brand or something of the sort. Okay. You know? I mean, you can't build a brand in a week or a month. Or, I mean, there, there are some things you have to set out to do that you know that there's a given timetable to, and you've got to be willing to play it through to the end. You know, and you won't necessarily have somebody declaring you the winner 10% yeah. along the way or 20%. Berkshire's an example of that. I mean, we had a bunch of terrible textile mills and it took real, real time to bring in other businesses and develop them and develop acquaintances with people that sell us businesses and so on. So uh, it, it's very important to realize the time, higher, time horizon, the natural time horizon of the task you set out to do. And uh, if you can't stand that time horizon, forget about getting on that, you know, on that particular task. Why, why do you think there is such a uh, impulse for people to have to trade in and out of their investments and, and trade in and out of you know, whatever it is, bonds or, or commodity? I mean, is it, do you think it's the, the thrill of it? Because it, you can look at all the great philosophies that you've had, but probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you do a better Warren Buffett imitation than anybody I know, um, I hope would, so. Yeah. Yeah. so. I want so, to get the imitating my signature yeah. on checks or no. <laughs> so, so, but I, I would say it's whole, you know, the ability to stay with your conviction and, and, and hold on and, because you believe in the business. That one concept itself seems to be elusive for so many people. Why do you think that is? It's so simple, too. I mean, if, if you were looking at a small private business in Omaha and you had some money uh, to buy into it, Maybe it's a McDonald's stand. Maybe it's a dry cleaning establishment. Big furniture what, what, store. What would you think about? You wouldn't think about, you know, what, what Janet Yellen's going to say next week, you know, or something. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be listening to the chatter on TV. You'd be thinking about the competitive advantage you might have, who might compete with you, what the return on capital is, what kind of a partner you're going to have in running it. All, all of the things that are fundamental to a business. Yeah. The biggest problem most people have is they don't think about a stock as being a part of a business. Mm -hmm. Now when they buy a farm, they think they're buying a farm and they, they say how many, how many bushels of corn will it produce or how many bushels of soybean will it produce in an average year, what are the taxes, what do I have to pay the tenant farmer? They look at it as an actual farming business. When they buy an apartment house, they say what can I rent it for, or how much vacancy will I have, what will it cost me to manage it, how often do I have to replace the roof, all of them, they look at it as a business. But when they look at a stock, a lot of people, when they look at a stock, they just look at it as something that people say may go up or maybe it'll split next week or, you know, or, or somebody's got a target price on it. Can you imagine having a target price on a farm or an apartment? Yep. It's crazy. Yep. So the key thing is to think about a stock as a part of a business. Just forget about the stock part. Do you of think it. people don't or the vast majority of people don't because 
Just because you can trade it? Because yeah, it's, it's, exactly. It's, it's, liquidity it's, makes them do stupid things. Yeah. The very fact, liquidity, which should be your friend. Yes. The fact that you can get out of it 10 minutes later, which you can't do with a farm or an apartment house, yeah. that should be your friend. But they turn it in, into a negative. My old boss, Ben Graham, mm -hmm. talked about having a partner named Mr. Market. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Market, you know, when you own a stock, Mr. Market comes around every day. Let's say it's, let's say it's General Motors. And he names you a price at which you can either buy more from him or you can sell to him. Mm -hmm. Now imagine having a McDonald's stand and you, you got one partner and that partner comes around and someday they're building a Burger King across or a Kentucky Fried and he gets pessimistic so he names a low price because he's afraid you're going to sell to him. So you buy from him. And other days he comes around, there's a big long line of cars in the drive-in. The other guy's shut down across the street so he thinks he better name a high price because you, uh, otherwise you might buy from him. So you get this very erratic partner who gives you a price every day which you can ignore if you wish but if he does says something silly you take advantage of him yep. now what kind of a partner do you want then you want some psychotic drunk you know because <laughs> you you want some guy that know wanders some all over the place you know yep. it gets yep. all enthused and all depressed yep. but you never forget that you're buying the business and he is the guy that's wandering around in a crazy way but stocks you put your finger on it because they're so liquid People think they have to make a decision every day because they can make a decision, and it's crazy. Yeah. Also, there's a propensity of people to gamble. Yeah. I mean, when I was 21, I went on my honeymoon. My wife was 19. We went through Las Vegas, and we, it was 1952, and we stopped at the Flamingo, which was then kind of a motel-like structure. Yeah. And I went in, and I saw all these well-dressed people, who had, most of whom had come 1,000 miles or so, and they've come to do stupid things. <laughs> and I looked around, and I thought, boy, am I going to get rich. <laughs> you know? I mean, imagine going 1,000 miles to, to throw a bunch of dice where you know you're going to lose money over time if you keep doing it. Yeah, it's and the, the thrill. That it's, and those people are making decisions in the stock market, and they set prices. And all you have to do is every now and then look at one and say, wait, that doesn't make any sense in terms of where it's selling. I mean, people were paralyzed. Uh, at the end of 2008. I mean, they were just yeah. plain scared. Treasury bills went to a negative yield. Imagine that. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you could put the money under the mattress and get a higher yield than you got on a Treasury bill. Yeah. When that's going on, you got to be out there with a great big tub. When it's raining gold, you do not want to be out with a teaspoon. Yeah. You want to be out there with a yeah. big so, ladle. You know? <laughs> so I'm never going to forget that last five seconds for the record. <laughs> it's just etched in my mind already, I can tell. Uh, you know, You've said mispriced at the beginning when you were talking about the Nebraska game, and then you sort of alluded to it right now. What percent of your wealth, success, whatever you want to call it, do you think is attributable to mispriced, and what, what percent is just attributable to you guys doing the work, doing the research, and loving the business? Well, you've got to do the second to know when it's mispriced. True. Yeah. So if I look at, well, just take, take the Ambassador Bridge yep. in 1970. Uh, my guess is, this is way back, but you were probably getting pre-tax 15% returns on if you bought the Ambassador Bridge. Now, here is something that, you know, is a necessity and, you know, the, the auto parts are going to flow back and forth. And yeah. even if you had just small increases over time, that was a great investment, you know. And, yeah. and that wasn't because I'm any genius or anything. I mean, anybody that knew anything, you know. But I looked at it as a business. And other people would look at it and say, well, the stock hasn't done anything for a couple of years. Well, who cares whether the stock's done anything for a couple of years? I mean, I don't care. I don't know whether my farm has done anything for a couple of years. I know what it can produce. So you got to look at it as a productive asset and not as something that wiggles around on a piece of paper. Do you get a feeling like when, when 2008 or other times where the market's just been rationally sold off, is this a... Is this a golden gut feeling, or is it just, you know, is it all of a sudden you look at a bunch of numbers and it click? How does, how do you come to the point where saying that, that day that you call it whatever, raining gold, how do you know it's a raining gold day? Well, you don't know that it won't rain more gold the next day. I was early. Okay. Uh, the market hit bottom in March of 2009, and I invested a lot of money. In it. So you never know what the market's going to do. I have the faintest idea what the market's going to do next week or next month, and I don't think about it. I don't know what farm prices are going to do next month. You know, I mean, I, it just... Yeah you've got to focus on where it's likely to be in five years or 10 years. Yeah. And, and you, you can't predict market fluctuations. And if you think you can, you know, you get in trouble. So I don't, that day 
in September when Goldman Sachs called me and they said, we need $5 billion. I might have been able to drive a much better deal the next day or the next week or next month. I just looked at the deal that was being offered to me and I said, this makes sense. And I don't worry about the fact I could have made a better deal yeah. a week later. Uh, how many stocks do you, well, I don't want to say stocks, companies. You, you have this other quote that you, you use. Uh, don't, don't, I, I don't want to get the words exactly, you know, right, I won't get them right now. Mm. But you said something like diversification is for people who don't do their homework or something like that. I may have it a little bit wrong, but your point was. Diversification is a protection against ignorance. That, that's even and, which is not, and there's nothing wrong better. with that, I mean, yep. at all. I mean, if, yep. if you don't follow companies and businesses, and you want to invest in the American economy, it makes a lot of sense yep. to buy an index fund. I mean, it makes the most sense because you don't know that much about specific companies, but you do know that America is going to be way ahead economically 10 and 20 and 30 years from now, and that's a way to own a slice of it. Yep. And, and, and how do you feel about America, five years, 10 oh. years? I mean, I know there's sort of these unprecedented challenges. I guess maybe every generation in some way, shape or form feels like they're having unprecedented challenges, but. Ah, no, uh, this, is, this is nothing. Yeah. We had a civil war. Yep. You know, just imagine that. I mean, yep. if, if, you, if you go back to 1776, mm -hmm. just imagine, just drive from here to Cleveland or drive anywhere you want okay. to, and think of what it looked like. It was nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Now, there were four million people around then. We're not smarter than they were. We don't work as hard as they do. But something has changed. All of, everything that's up here is profit, basically. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, a given person may own a house where they owe the money to the bank, but somebody's got the money in the bank that lent it to them, as long as it's not owned internationally. Mm -hmm. This whole country you know, is what's been created in a very short period of time, you know, less than 240 years. And it's, it's an amazing. During my lifetime, I was born in 1930. Mm -hmm. Since I was born, the real GDP per capita in inflation just Can we just terms. clarify one thing in that? I, I really, something I've always, what is a capita? That, and per, people say per capita, is that per household, per person? No, it's what per is, person, per, per person. How come they don't say per person? They just say capita, it's a, is that a business school? Where I, I've always, no, I'm, I'm serious. It's one of these things well, I've always I, wanted to know. I, I probably won't go to sleep tonight worrying about that, yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, what you like, uh, what? Warren Buffett's I'll here, I figure I'd ask you that question. You, for no, you stay up tonight worrying about it. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. think about other things. Okay. <laughs> but per capita. Per capita. There's okay. 50,000 of GDP per capita. Okay. That is six times in real terms what it was when I was born. One person's lifetime. Hmm. Six for one. And that's inflation adjusted. That's inflation adjusted. Oh. That is what this system produces. Hmm. Our system unleashes human potential like nothing ever has. I met 64 people over there that have taken the course for the yep. 10,000 small business. Those people have just started to use their potential and it's going to blossom into things. If you go back to 1790, we had 4 million people. The Chinese had about 300 million. They're just, they were just as smart as we were. They worked just as hard. Their soil was more or less the same and everything. And yet, a couple hundred years later, you know, we had 25% almost of the world's output and they had far, far less, even though they had far, far more people. It wasn't because we were smarter. It's because we had a system that unleashed yeah. human potential. And that game has just begun. Yeah. I mean, we, we've got a, there's, there's no surer bet than that America's economic progress will continue at a, at a good clip. It may not include everybody. That's a different question. Now, yeah. how it gets distributed is another question. but. Yeah. The overall pie is going to grow. Speaking of, of wealth being created, one of the things that I've come across anyway, especially over the last like five to ten years, talking to young people, colleges, uh, even small business people, even, even people working at big companies, the concept of wealth being created. Yeah, do you think we cover that enough in the education of school systems? Because I'm not sure that everybody totally understands. I'm not sure I even totally understood it maybe mm -hmm. until ten years ago that literally it gets created. There's sort of this view maybe that there's a limited pie and maybe no. the government creates it or something that gets split up every year. It's how, not a limited how, pie. No, how do, we, how, do, how do we though as a country or city or state, or, how do we get that message across? Because once it's across, then everybody says, well, if it, it gets created, then, then I can create it. Yeah, I don't worry too much about it when I see those 64 people yeah, I that, saw this that morning. Was incredible. They are all out trying to improve the lot of themselves and their families. 
and they will be thinking. When I was, you know, when I was at McClure's Pickles, you know, last night, mm -hmm. those guys are thinking about how they can have new customers, new products, how they can turn it out, you know, how they can how, how they can have a, those fill those jars faster, how they can have a better product, all the time. You know, just like Henry Ford was thinking, you know, 100 plus years ago about how, how that car could come down the assembly line faster. The, the incentives in a market system really drive more and more output. They don't do it with every single person, but yeah. they do it with enough people that the pie will continue to increase. But so let, let's, let's talk about that issue you just raised about the, um, the wealth and sometimes people use the word distributed, I'm not so sure, you know, it's, or, or gets created in different places. Whatever word you use, how do we get more people, more people maybe that have been minorities or are minorities and people who've been economically uh, depressed or whatever for maybe even generations or people are, aren't as educated as other people? Uh, how, do we, how do we break that? How do we become, how do more and more people become participants in this great system? Well, you certainly want to have equality of opportunity. Mm -hmm. You want everybody to have a shot. Uh, you know, we wrote the Declaration of Independence in 70, 1776 and we said all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. Then in 1789, we wrote a constitution which said blacks were three-fifths of a person yeah. and which treated women in many cases in, in the, in, if you read Article Two of the Constitution about the presidency, the male pronoun is used throughout it. I mean, they sort of gave themselves away there. And, you know, it, <laughs> it, 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 it took until 1920. You mean know, the, he, 19, the male pronoun, like he, the male pronoun? Is that what a, yeah, well, it, like, like, it, 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 they didn't do it with the House of Representatives. They didn't do it with judges. Okay. But with the presidents, they kind of slipped in and they oh. referred to him and he okay. and a few times. Uh, this was only, you know, 13 years after Jefferson said we're all created equal. But and so far uh, they've been right. So, so we, probably unfortunately. Well, we all, you know, until 19... In, until the 19th Amendment, 1920, I mean, women were officially second-class citizens, and even then, it's taken a long time. So that makes me enormously bullish on America, because I, I think we are going always in the right direction, and I think if you look at what we accomplished using half our talent, you know, up till 1920, just like what we're going to do with all of our talent. Yeah. So I, th this country's got a long, long way to go. Yeah. Is there anything, policies, is there anything, even the, the even businesses who are, who have a lot of, they have a lot, a lot of businesses have a lot of power, they have a lot of influence, a lot of leverage, is there, you know, whether it's, it's compulsory or not compulsory, is there anything that you think should be done or could be done or that, that, to speed that process up? I mean, I don't, the, 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 what we saw this morning was an example. I mean, for those of you that weren't there, Goldman Sachs, there are 10,000 businesses. There, I have to tell you something, we've, we've been in Detroit now four years and, and one month, so. 49 months, the 30 minutes that, that I watched this graduation of these 64 businesses and the passion and enthusiasm and excitement in that room, it was probably the best 30 minutes. I have nothing against what was going on here. I heard it was great, but the, the, the 30 minutes, it was, it was truly remarkable. And do we need more of that? I mean, I'm just asking, what, what sure, do you Those are 64 people that have expanded their horizons about what their potential can be. That's wonderful. And they got plenty of potential. but. You know, the people are a product of what they're taught early on and all of that. And, mm -hmm. and, and until many people, and, you know, particularly true historically in terms of females and blacks, they, just, they were just told they had a limited rise. And my sisters, just as smart as I am, you know, they were born around 1930 on either side of it. Mm -hmm. They were told, not by words particularly, but just it was an invisible message, that they could be a nurse, a stenographer, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a retail clerk, you know, but they, they, they couldn't have dreamt about what I was dreaming about. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, it was just, it was pathetic. Uh, it was unfair. And we're making progress all the time on that. But those 64 people we saw today, yep. they have a different picture of themselves than they had 12 or 13 weeks ago, you know. And they will have a different picture a year and five years from now, too. It, uh, human potential is incredible. No, no question. A horse that can count to 10 is a, remar is a remarkable horse, not a remarkable mathematician. Right, Samuel Johnson, I think, said that. Is that, okay. <laughs> yeah. Then well, got, uh, but what, did you say it? Did you say Samuel Johnson, or I just told you? <laughs> better. Yeah, what, well, did you use that quote in that term ever? Because it, did you ever use it? Did you ever repeat it? Do you want to read it right now? <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Well, okay. I think maybe my partner, Charlie Muggers, explained that to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, there's a lot of things. 
I've gotten a lot of wisdom from other people. Uh, you want to hang around smart people and ha hang around people that are better than you are, which has not been difficult for me. You want to marry somebody better than you are, for that matter. I mean, you, you, will, you will move in the direction of the people you hang around with. And I've had some wonderful teachers. Let's talk about the education system. And, and you know, again, I, I, I don't know. You, you seem to know and read about everything, so I assume you, you have some view of it. But uh, in Detroit, particularly here, we've had, we've had these challenges uh, for decades in the education system. Uh, anything just big sweeping thought you think that we should do differently, whether it's charter, or whether it's public, or is there anything different thematically? That it's we really, do? educational system in the United States are really difficult to change. I mean, mm -hmm. they're local, they're uh, unionized in many cases, uh, they, uh, sometimes they're underfunded, although the funding is really pretty huge. I mean, we, we, we spend almost $12,000 per kid per year yeah. on 50 million kids in the United States. So uh, we spend the money. Uh, but I, I'm a, almost a fanatic on having a good public school system. And uh, uh, was there anything that, yeah, I'm sure you've seen, you know, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of good groups all around. Yeah. Is there anything that, you know, I, maybe there is, usually it's not just one thing. To, well, no, and, and I, think, I think actually, uh, and my daughter's very involved in this, as, uh, she runs a foundation which I help fund, mm -hmm. uh, is getting started very early. I mean, the kid that has been parked in front of a TV set for five years before they get to kindergarten, well, the, nobody's there really, basically, and, yeah. and does not have the same shot as my kid's going to have, you know. I mean, the vocabulary you pick up, everything contributes so much to your learning over life. Uh, so. You really have to go back as far as you can and try and give everybody an equal shot. And overall, you know, I was a product of the public school system, mm -hmm. and uh, all my kids, my grandchildren. There's never been a Buffett in Omaha that's gone to a private school. Uh, but uh, it, it it should be the concern, not just of every parent, but every citizen that you yep. that you have one. And I think there's a lot of money being spent. Eli Broad was here. He's done a lot. Uh, working in that area, the Gates Foundation, which I support. I mean, we've, we've got to figure out what works best, and then the hard part will be implementing it, perhaps. Yeah. Now, there's, but, a, there's great resistance to change. Yeah. Let, let's uh, shift over to the giving pledge. So yeah. uh, giving pledge is, a, is something I believe you and, and Bill Gates decided. How did that happen first? How did it start? About, it was about five years ago. We were yep. talking, Bill and Melinda and I, and, and uh, uh, we got the idea first of calling uh, David Rockefeller and seeing if he'd get together a little dinner in New York for some people. And Mayor Bloomberg was there and, and David hosted it. And we, Eli Broad was there with Edie and uh, uh, Julian Robertson, Oprah Winfrey. We had about 15 of us and I asked people, I started at one part of the table and I asked people just to talk about their philosophy of giving, not, not necessarily what they particularly did, but how, how, why do it and how, how do they think about it? It took two and a half hours to get around the table, and I knew we had something then. That, that It was something that a lot of wealthy people, some people just, they become wealthy sort of, you know, and all of a sudden they discover they're wealthy, and they really haven't thought about what they do with their money. Um, Warren, tell everybody just what it, what it is in general. I'm not sure everybody totally. Oh, yeah, that. well, the pledge, well, then what the pledge came out of this was we organized this gr group, which now has 127 members, and these are people, and we worked on billionaires. Uh, and we, uh, we ask them to morally pledge, not legally pledge, but morally pledge, they will give away at least half of their net worth during their life or at death. And I have been very pleasantly surprised, as I've called a lot of people, uh, and Bill's called more than I've called, and we have gotten 127 people with... What's your batting average? Like well, it, 120, it, it, what's, it was, the, what's the denominator? It was, it was pretty, pretty good, but, but the most... Every now and then somebody tells me, you know, all of these people have got a billion dollars, at least according to Forbes, and some of them say, you know, I'm not sure I can do it, you know. And so I think there's a market for a book I'm going to write, which is going to be called How to Get By on 500 Million. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, I mean, there, there are a lot of people yeah. out there, oh, don't laugh at these people, they're out there wrestling with that problem, apparently. <laughs> I just... <laughs> I, that's why I asked. Like, but the batting what, average, yeah, what's the batting average? Because the batting I, average was, was pretty high 
initially, it's less high as we go along mm -hmm. because uh, we've had most of the people that uh, 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 either agreed with us initially or, or quickly came around to it. But some people, we've, they've changed their minds on it. And, changed and, their mind positive. You, you in a positive that, direction, yeah. yeah. And you, you didn't have anybody ever say, okay, and then, nah, but by the way, I'm only going to go with 40%. No, no, that, 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 but I've got plenty of people that just don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but we've turned it, I mean, it's, it's more than what I've just described because we have a, a meeting every year, we have learning sessions on different subjects, like education. Mm -hmm. The idea is that we can, we can learn from each other. People are often very interested in how different families handle it. They wonder, mm -hmm. you know, should I bring my kids into this? How will they feel about it? You know, and, and, and particularly if they've inherited a lot of money themselves, they wonder if they're sort of breaking a covenant with the past if they don't pass it all on because it got passed on to them. So there's all kinds of questions come up. Uh, and we, we try to have various sessions that address that. And, and we had, at this last meeting we had, we had a very well-known fellow who was a very smart guy, and he talked about his mistakes in philanthropy, which I think is, you know, it's, 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 it's helpful to people. So it's been, a, it's been productive so far. We ask people to write letters as to why they do this. And if you go to givingpledge.org, you can read all these letters, and, and I think those letters will have an effect 10 and 50 and maybe 100 years from now in terms of what other people of wealth uh, do with their money. It's, I mean, what, what, what's great about it is it just, the more people that do it, 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 really, it really gives the right message to people who have accumulated wealth or inherited I, it. I've had and two people travel from South Africa to see me in Omaha, yeah. just solely for the purpose of talking about it and talking about the problems they might have uh, the, how the situation might be different there and all of that. Uh, one of them joined the, uh, the uh, giving pledge and he and his wife and I mean, so it's, it, it's having an effect around the world even and it's certainly having an effect in the, in the United States. And, it, and we have a good time doing it. That's, and, and the Gates Foundation, which is the vast majority of your wealth where it's being left correct, committed to it, yeah. Committed to, yeah. Um, how do they determine where they're going to allocate well, their basic, awesome their basic principle, and this is why I've joined with them, mm -hmm. is that every human life is of equal value. Now, that can lead you a lot of ways, but, but they start out with that premise. That's what, they're, that's what they want their giving to embody that belief. And that focuses them pretty heavily on improving health throughout the world because uh, for a very limited amount of money, you can... Yeah. You can cause a lot more people to live a lot better lives or just to be alive at all around the world. Uh, uh, we, we don't preach any particular philanthropy. If, if somebody wants to give it to X, Y, or Z, God bless them, you know, I mean, they're, they're, yeah. but... So, so like if a city, for instance, had half the amount of money needed for blight removal or something like that, would they go, no, I'm really serious, would they go to, would they go to the, the would they make a pitch to a foundation like that, like the Gates Foundation, or I think Gates. Or the given, or I think given. most foundations, including Gates, mm -hmm. because the demands would be unlimited, oh, for sure. and you would always be listening to the friends of friends and all of that sort of yep. thing. Yep. So they try to define their areas of interest, and when you get up to the size of Gates, Gates will give away close to four billion dollars yep. this year. Uh, you really have to. You have to have your interests defined. Mm -hmm. You have to have a certain number of people specializing it. You have to have some people checking to make sure that what you thought was going to happen actually does happen. Yeah. I mean, it, it becomes a pretty big business. Uh, and it does, it, it can't really listen to individual. Yeah. Well, well, now, my, my sister does. I have, a, I have a sister that's 86 now. She's called the Sunshine Lady. She spends all day, every day, hmm giving away money retail. It would drive me crazy. <laughs> I know. Uh, so giving away I'm a wholesale, wholesale guy. Wholesale you know. is a lot easier. Yeah. But she, yeah. and she's got a group of sunbeams, as she calls them. Yep. It's a scream. You can make a movie about it. <laughs> but they do a terrific job. Let's just say, so we, the way we, some of us are characterized in Detroit, we have blight, crime, education, and jobs. I mean, that's pretty much the big four. And, and jobs and, are the most important. Correct. I mean, and is, there, is it unprecedented that a city well, it's unprecedented to see our size have gone through a bankruptcy, but that they would make a case to hit X amount of foundations, you know, not, not individually, like you're saying, retail, but the whole list, whether it's education, whether it's in the jobs part, whether it's in the blight part. Is that something, do you think, that would have a chance of success? It's usually going to work better with local philanthropists, like the Kellogg Foundation or somebody like okay. that. I mean, it, 
you'll find, you'll find most, most, most foundations, either they have some very broad topic, yeah. like global health or something of the sort, or they tend to be very lo localized. And, and, right. and what about in the education? Is education some of the... Well, education is something that I would say a very significant percentage of big philanthropists are trying to look at ways to get it done better. So they're willing to do experimental things uh, yeah. in this city or that city. They're, 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 you know, they're looking to create an example which then can be extrapolated throughout the, throughout the society. Yeah. So one of the things we you know, sort of talked about on this, on, of, of the things is, because they do an annual meeting, the Giving Pledge, having them come to Detroit and do an annual, you know, because they're doing an annual meeting anyway, and, and that would be something that I don't know, that maybe, maybe we could talk. What do you think? Just, Give it a shot or something. I'll make the yeah. And when you give something a shot, it usually happens. Yeah, so, well, yeah, just give it a shot. So uh, just to you know, to expose people to Detroit, the good and and the bad, of course, like like people are are doing here in this room. Um, I have a couple, just a couple last things. We got about six minutes here. Um, you said that unless I got somebody else's quote here, which you never know. Okay. Um, the most important thing to do if you find yourself in a hole is to stop digging. That is certainly true. Okay. So, so is there, when, when you, now is that your quote? No. Oh, come, seriously? I steal going? them all. Okay. No, I, I've got a few original. Well, when, when did you say it? When, did you say it under certain circumstances? Did something precipitate that happening? Yeah, I've, I've seen not only in, in business, but in a lot of other areas yep. that, that people persist in doing something where the, the evidence really shows it's nuts, you know. That, that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was Sa Santayana that said, fanaticism consists of redoubling your efforts when you've forgotten your aim. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of people doing that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, you, should, you should have checkpoints on anything. Mm -hmm. and, and it's best if you determine the criteria for those checkpoints well before you reach the checkpoint. Otherwise, you'll yeah. just start readjusting you know, you'll, you'll shoot the arrow and then you go out and paint the bullseye around wherever the arrow <laughs> lands. <laughs> so, so how are you doing? You're, you're 80, just turned 84? 84. 84. I mean, that's 84. truly remarkable, and I'm not just saying this because I'm up here with I'd rather be a little more remarkable than make, maybe at 90 or so. <laughs> yeah. but, but, I mean, you're not a lot of 84-year-olds have everything going like you have it going. I mean, your mind and your well, hearing and everything. So, so is there anything you think in your life that you do that, that keeps you so young for an 84-year-old? Well, I... I get to do what I love to do mm -hmm. every day with people I love. I mean, it couldn't be any better. I mean, imagine if I was retired, so and I spent all week planning my haircut. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was. I think I, you know, <laughs> pretty fast. No, I, 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 I think, I think if you can find something, and there could be a lot of other things besides business, but that you can be passionate about, you know. It's going to do wonders for you. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, and I, I do think, you know, I've been so lucky in life that I, you know, I've got nothing to complain about. But life is a lot of fun, and, and I've got wonderful friends. You know, it, so it, it, Have you always had this much fun? It just seems like maybe you've been having a lot more fun lately, or is it? No, I've, have you always I've, had this much I've fun? I've always had, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, went through a period when, yeah. When I went through a period in, in my early teens when I was. I, went, I was totally maladjusted, but, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I blame that on various other things, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would say, well, actually, my, my, my first wife straightened me out. I mean, she, mm -hmm. she put me together. I was, I was yep. a mess going into that, but she put me together. And, and, and I was very, very lucky that way. Yeah. And, uh, uh, hey, hey, how have you dealt with the everywhere you go, the fame, internationally known face personality? How, how is that for you? Is that... Bad, good, both. I mean, how, how, how have you handled? Is it? Uh, there's, there's not much. There's really no downside. I ran into somebody the other day. The guy said, "You look a lot like Warren Buffett." <laughs> and I, I said, uh, "A lot of people tell me that." <laughs> and he said, uh, "Does it piss you off?" <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> how did you answer that question? <laughs> There, 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 there's not much downside to it. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, Warren, so there's three minutes left. I want to know, I, 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 I did this, I had my, our technology guys do this uh, quick little exercise, because I know you're, you're getting on a plane, you're going back to Omaha? Yeah. And I, so I figured that, you know, we, we 
very, very grateful and thankful that you, that you came here both this morning and today. Really appreciate it. And we know that our governor and our mayor, you know, could use a little bit of the oracle of Omaha's touch. So I tried this. I don't know if it's going to work. So we took Mike Duggan, the mayor, Mike Duggan, and if we took Mike Duggan, the mayor, and we combined, or do I have to, do I click this myself? You guys, is that what I'm doing? Okay. We then we combined them with Warren Buffett through this magical technology, just to see if they can, if they can hang on to a little bit of you. We can create, actually, a mayor here by the name of Warren Duggan. <laughs> what do you think? He'll never get elected. No? <laughs> OK. I mean, look at that. that then we could, we could actually do the same thing with the governor, for the heck of it. We take Rick Snyder, Warren Buffett, and just so they can hang on a little bit of you, both at the state and the city level, we can create here the new governor, which would be Warren <laughs> Snyder. If you're going to Just, do this for real, I'd like to make a suggestion or yeah, two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to thank you very much. It's been a lot it's of been fun. A pleasure. And if there's one parting, one parting word for, for Detroit and Detroiters or the folks here who have, have so nicely come into town and and are engaged uh, about the future of this, this city. Last parting advice. Well, I just say, like, like Freddy Krueger, I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.